crystals, clearly I'm not going to explain the entire uh, subject because it is uh, huge. Uh, the list of things that I'm not going to talk about probably is going to be much, not probably, but definitely it's going to be much longer than the list of things that I'm going to cover. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, uh, well, actually, let me maybe um, discuss what I'm not going to talk about at the end and not in the beginning. <laughs> that, that makes probably more sense. Uh, so uh, what I want to discuss um, would be uh, variational theories for uh, pneumatic uh, liquid crystals, uh, in particular, uh, Asin Frank, uh, Landau Dijens, and um, Erickson theory for pneumatics with variable degree of orientation. And I will try to establish some connection between those. And um, then we'll see where this goes. Okay, so, and uh, obviously part of my talk because uh, Peter already uh, discussed some aspects of modeling of uh, liquid crystals. So some parts of what I'm going to say clearly are going to intersect with him. Uh, so if uh, we want to derive a, or design uh, a variational theory for, um, for anything, in fact, uh, we need to come up with uh, some sort of uh, descriptor of our physical object. Uh, we need to come up with um, uh, an appropriate uh, functional class to which the descriptor is going to belong. Uh, we need to introduce uh, some sort of an energy and then uh, go on from there. Uh, so in this case, and I guess that historically that is uh, how things uh, proceeded, uh, the most obvious way to describe uh, orientationally and orientationally ordered material is to uh, specify a vector, locally specify a vector uh, of preferred orientations of molecules of pneumatic liquid crystal in this case. Uh, again, maybe it's a rod -like, mo rod like molecules, uh, disc like molecules, aggregates of disc like molecules, uh, whatever. Uh, so, as a descriptor, we're going to use uh, a so-called director, uh, director field. It's a unit vector field uh, in R3. And so, as I said, it is going to represent the local orientation of pneumatic molecules near a given point in a three-dimensional domain omega. Uh, so, in this case, uh, then this is our, going to be our descriptor, uh, the director. And uh, so we need to specify, like I said before, a functional space. We need to uh, uh, determine the energy functional. Uh, and in the case of a director, uh, the energy functional should take into account elastic distortions uh, of a director field. And uh, also uh, somewhere uh, the interactions between the pneumatic molecules and the uh, boundaries of the container that contains those molecules that also have to be incorporated. Uh, so this interaction with the walls of the container is going to be described by so-called anchoring conditions, which is just a fancy name for boundary conditions for the director field uh, on, on the omega. Uh, so in this case, uh, a lot of different effects can be taken into account. I might uh, mention a magnetic field later on, uh, but uh, for the main part of my talk, uh, there is no magnetic field. Okay, so uh, the principal modes of uh, deformation in this already appears the, in Peter talk uh, are going to be uh, splay of a director, twist of a director, and bend of a director. And they are described uh, respectively by similarly colored uh, terms here, uh, as well as a, a subtle splay term, which eventually becomes a null Lagrangian. Uh, and it's easy to convince yourself that uh, these guys correspond to uh, these particular modes. 
uh, simply by playing with some easy uh, ansatzes of this. Uh, so if one wants to describe, uh, to define a quadratic uh, energy based on the gradient, that that's going to be uh, assuming that the appropriate frame uh, invariance and symmetries are satisfied, this is going to be uh, your only uh, possible choice of uh, energy density. So this is a Nocin Frank energy density. Uh, so what about the boundary conditions? Oh, we have several choices. So in principle, uh, in uh, realistic physical systems, the molecules can be so-called hemiotropic, uh, oriented perpendicular to the boundary of a container. Uh, so that would be a Dirichlet condition on the director field that will give you a Dirichlet condition on the director field, director field on the boundary, as it will require that N is uh, a unit vector perpendicular to the boundary. So it's basically like a unit normal vector. Uh, you can have planar boundary conditions uh, where the director wants to be parallel to the boundary. A uh, couple of choices are possible here. Uh, maybe one particular direction is uh, going to be fixed, or maybe the director just wants to be parallel to the boundary, but otherwise its direction is uh, degenerate. So then if you want to impose this kind of boundary conditions, this is sort of like a Robin boundary condition. And the uh, tilted boundary condition is similar to the planar, except that uh, you now require that the director has a specified angle uh, with the normal. Uh, and again, uh, the direction can be either degenerate with a specified angle or uh, just fixed. So that is one choice uh, what uh, one can do. So this basically is kind of like a Dirichlet condition. Or the second choice is to, again mentioned by Peter, it's uh, so-called Rapini popular energy, which uh, simply penalizes for the director uh, deviations from uh, the preferred orientation on the boundary. Uh, so for instance, uh, in a case like this, if the parameter gamma is positive, then the uh, director wants to be perpendicular to the um, uh, unit normal nu. Uh, if gamma is negative, then it wants to be parallel to nu. Uh, or more generally, you can impose this condition and that will correspond to a tilted boundary conditions. So uh, for the future, two choices. Either we add uh, the boundary integral which penalizes for deviation of orientations from some preferred uh, choice or we can impose Dirichlet boundary data. Okay, so then we arrive at um, our, I think, Frank variational problem. Uh, so it, we integrate the energy density that I showed you previously and then uh, impose appropriate boundary data. Uh, this problem was considered uh, already a while ago, back in 1986, by Hart, Kinderler, and Lin, who determined that uh, the minimizers of this problem exist among all possible S2 value maps in H1. Uh, and uh, any minimizer is smooth apart except for uh, some closed set of a Hausdorff uh, dimension strictly less than one. Uh, so that means that, for example, if uh, uh, it means, for example, the, the minimizers of this kind of energy cannot uh, support uh, so-called line singularities or disclinations, and in principle, only uh, point singularities are possible, except that uh, dimension is strictly less than one. So it's from this result, it's not clear exactly uh, what how the singular set looks like. Okay, so uh, when all the elastic constants are the same in this case and the saddle flake constant is zero, uh, then the asynthrotic energy just reduces to a Dirichlet integral. Uh, and uh, so this becomes a harmonic map problem. Uh, one thing that I mentioned already before is that the saddle flake term, in fact, is a null Lagrangian. So if your variational problem is subject to the Dirichlet boundary data, then...
uh, this term simply reduces to a constant and it doesn't play any role uh, in minimization. Uh, it's something that I mentioned in the previous slide already that the line singularities that are present, uh, that are known experimentally to be present in pneumatic liquid crystals are not supported by this model. Uh, so in particular, if uh, you have a singularity like this, which corresponds to a disclination that points along the z-axis, then within this model, this configuration has this, the configuration with the singularity has an infinite energy, and so then the uh, variational problem uh, doesn't make any sense. And so what one has to do is, if you want to, uh, describe situations like this, what you want to do is to uh, somehow adjust your uh, energy functional, your functional space, so that uh, configurations like this uh, now can be included. And a variety of things, of things can be done to achieve this. Uh, so one possible uh, choice is to replace uh, the director by a higher dimension order parameter. Uh, for example, uh, in Erickson theory of pneumatics of variable degree of orientation, again mentioned by Peter, in addition to uh, the director, you also have a scalar order parameter which is uh, called the degree of orientation, or uh, the landau dijens -Tensor, tensor theory, also you end up with a or the parameter which has higher dimension than just uh, the director. Uh, the second choice is to uh, modify the energy functional. So for instance, instead of uh, energy that is quadratic in the gradient, use uh, an energy which has a lower power than two, in which case, again, the configuration like the disclination that I showed you on the previous slide is going to have a finite energy. Uh, so this also uh, has an advantage when you do things like this, when you uh, start playing with the functional space, uh, that now uh, if you do this, then you can also uh, then deal with issues like orientability, which I'm going to uh, discuss shortly. Uh, so in the sense that if you, for example, consider a director in a uh, space of special functions uh, of bounded variation, which allows for jumps, then uh, you, you allow for n to jump from one direction to another. And as, uh, if you uh, think about this after I talk about orientability, you'll, you'll see that then it's possible in principle to consider models like this and deal with orientability. Uh, so some, this, is, um, this idea was, uh, I believe, introduced by Boland Bifford in 2014. I know that Amit Acharya also has been talking about it uh, about the same time. And uh, for some uh, recent developments, uh, you can um, look at the work by Ignat and Lamy, Kanivari, Majordar, and Strofolini. Uh, so, um, one, uh, one then uh, observation that I want to make, uh, if we don't think about uh, the second point, if we stick uh, to the uh, quadratic, to energy functionals which are quadratic in the gradients of your uh, order parameter, then uh, any version uh, that is of a continuum theory that is going to be based on a vector field uh, is going to only work uh, for uniaxial pneumatics because it's not going to then allow one to model uh, the issue of biaxiality. Again, that I'm going to discuss shortly. Okay, so uh, then let me uh, consider the first generalization, which is uh, basically, again, you're still dealing with a director, uh, but uh, you also have an additional scalar parameter, S. So in addition to the data. And uh, the easiest way actually to think about this is, so you have S, which tells you 
which describes the quality of orientational order at a given point, and n, which gives you that preferred orientation. Uh, so one way to think about this is to consider, instead of uh, vector field n, maybe you consider vector field s times n, in which case uh, s times n is no longer going to have, uh, satisfy a new unit length constraint, that rigidity actually that causes uh, the energy to be infinite in the first place when you work with the uh, unit vector field. And uh, then in that case, a gradient energy uh, does not have to explode anymore. Uh, so in a simplified version of uh, the Erickson energy functional, uh, so in principle, uh, you have to, one has to use a so-called column and null procedure to define, to derive how the uh, energy function is going to look like in this case. Uh, but sweeping all of these issues under the rug, at the end of the day, uh, in the simplest possible case, when a lot of elastic constants are going to be the same, and we ignore a lot of things, uh, your energy function will look like this. So now, gradient of n is uh, getting multiplied by uh, the order parameter s. And so then, if you want your energy to be bounded, then uh, clearly, wherever the gradient uh, want to blow up, uh, the order parameter will want to go to zero, which means that uh, whenever uh, n changes rapidly and uh, sort of the degree of the orientation, the preferred orientation no longer makes sense, then at that point, the degree of orientation is going to be very small. So the quality of orientational order is uh, pretty bad. So in fact, your energy, uh, your uh, pneumatic vector field is close to being isotropic rather than pneumatic. So S equal to zero then corresponds to the vector field to actually to the material, which is isotropic, which doesn't have a preferred orientation anymore, uh, while S equal to one or minus one half, I'm not going to explain why these magic values uh, occur, but uh, suffice it to say that when S is equal to one, then it is assumed that all pneumatic molecules are pointing in the same direction uh, N, so uh, of N, so that your orientational order is perfect. And when S is equal to minus one half, uh, all molecules are perpendicular to uh, N, and that is also, in a sense, a perfect configuration because at least one orientation of n is prescribed. So these uh, two situations actually will never happen in the real material because you will never see exactly everybody oriented in the same way. So that means for that reason, the assumption of Erickson was that uh, this potential that you now introduce, which is temperature dependent and uh, it's also dependent on S, uh, that this potential is going to go to infinity when S uh, approaches these uh, non-physical values. Uh, at the same time, uh, and at the same time, W is minimized at some particular value of S, which is a preferred degree of orientation in your material at a given temperature. And so typically, uh, people assume that W is uh, a function which is always positive and it has a single minimum at some point as zero of t. Uh, so this explains these two terms, and then the third term uh, penalizes for variations of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the order parameter uh, of the degree of orientation uh, sort of in a natural way. Okay, so this is uh, a highly simplified version of uh, Erickson uh, energy for uh, pneumatics with variable of degree of, degree of orientation. Uh, so one important fact here is that uh, depending on how you design your potential W of S and T, uh, you can design it in such a way so that the temperature, if the temperature is high, then S equal to zero is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, the minimizer the minimum of W of ST. And if so, if S is an isotropic state, that means that if temperature is high, then 
your material prefers to be in the isotropic state everywhere. Uh, on the other hand, when the temperature is low, uh, is low, then uh, it's minimized at some S0, which is not equal to zero. So that means that uh, some degree of pneumatic order is preferred. And like I said before, uh, if you make the parameters Kn and Ks equal to each other, uh, then you can interpret um, the energy in this way, which basically is exactly the, uh, the standard version of a simplified Ginzburg-Landau energy function. So in that sense, Erickson model is uh, at its root similar to a Ginzburg-Landau energy. And then, uh, if so, then clearly, if we choose a coefficient k appropriately, uh, so, and for example, if we let k in this case go to infinity, then you will see uh, singularities that are typical of a Ginzburg-Landau model. All right, so uh, this then uh, looks pretty good, uh, except for uh, the issues that I mentioned before, uh, namely, yet to be discussed, biaxiality and orientability, uh, these are not going to be uh, modelable within this framework. Uh, so basically, the only issue that you resolved so far is uh, the issue that you now allow for the line defects in addition to point defects, but that's it. Okay, so let's talk uh, about orientability. Again, I'm just going to be repeating uh, to some extent what Peter, Peter already said, that uh, in, uh, in a pneumatic molecule, actually, it's, uh, or a pneumatic material, given, looking at a given point, it's the probability of finding the head or a tail of a molecule pointing in a particular direction is going to be exactly the same. Uh, so if we start at the uh, molecular level and we try to uh, construct some sort of a, um, mean field uh, continuum theory, uh, and we want to uh, then uh, consider moments of some probability distribution of, uh, so instead of, again, repeating, uh, quoting Peter, uh, if I'm looking at the probability distribution of molecular orientations at a given point, I don't want to work with a probability distribution. Rather, I would consider moments. And then clearly, if the probability of finding a head and tail is going to be exactly the same everywhere, then the first moment is always going to be zero, and it's going to carry no information. So then, uh, what one has to do is that, uh, let's see, what am I doing here? Uh, so what one has to do is, instead, uh, you want to can start considering second moments. And second moments, um, in a sense, well, so if you now think back about the director theory, uh, rather than using N as your object, as your descriptor, instead, you might want to use uh, N tensor N because that quantity is going to be symmetric with respect to, it's not going to change, it's going to be invariant with respect to the changes of the direction of n. Uh, so possibly n tensor n should be your object and not, uh, and not n itself. Uh, so then, uh, uh, actually, talking about, about orientability, Any uh, state that you're trying to describe should be invariant with respect to switching and to direction of n to the opposite. Uh, and so then the question arises, if I find some uh, energy minimizing configuration and that configuration is describable by n, uh, is that actually my minimizer or maybe something else as a minimizer because maybe the director field uh, that is maybe the orientations field actually is uh, not uh, And here is an important uh, result by uh, Bolin-Zarnescu, uh, 
that the local orientation of pneumatic molecules is described by line fields uh, in RP2, not by a vector field, and the classical, I've seen Frank, uh, theory predictions will possibly give incorrect predictions uh, when a minimizing uh, line thin field is not necessarily real. And an easy example of that is, uh, for example, Example is, for example, this uh, so-called stadium configuration. Uh, so if uh, we want the director field to uh, look like this, then uh, if we're not prescribing any orientation to N, then clearly the line field like this is, uh, is a possible competitor that would actually have a finite energy. Uh, but if you try to uh, have an orientable uh, field, then this is no longer going to be possible because if your field is orientable, then once you go around the hole in the stadium configuration, uh, then you end up with a direction of a vector which is, perpendicular, which is opposite to the direction that you started with. Uh, so that means that instead of a uniform vector field uh, between the holes, uh, you actually have to have a vector field uh, rotate, which obviously is going to be in a configuration of a higher range. So it is possible that the non-orientable from this picture, it is possible or feasible that uh, a non-orientable field actually is going to be your configuration rather than the uh, uh, configuration that is orientable and described by a vector field. Uh, further, uh, in uh, pneumatics, uh, it's common to see something called the uh, degree one-half disclination. So in this case, if uh, we go around uh, this point, which is a point of a pneumatic disclination, then one can see that the line field gains uh, an additional vector of, uh, additional angle of pi. Clearly, this configuration also is not orientable because uh, if we start with some particular orientation going, in, let's say, to the, to the right, uh, once you go around, then assuming that your vector is continuous everywhere, then you end up with a discontinuity along the horizontal line. So this actually is where uh, the theorists that rely on SBV valued functions, for example, can be helpful because if your vector fields, if your vector field has a discontinuity somewhere, then that vector field can be described within an SBV field. So the theory that we want would be the one that should be able to uh, include configurations. You should be able to describe configurations like this. Uh, so I already discussed this. Uh, so we talk about uh, the fact that the first moment is actually not going to give you any information. And the first uh, somehow non-zero information comes from a second moment. And so uh, you take a second moment, you observe a couple of things that uh, number one, uh, the second moment, matrix, so second moment matrix must be uh, symmetric. It must have a trace one because rho integrates to one. And then, although it is not, strictly speaking, uh, necessary, uh, the following thing is done to the second moment matrix. Uh, we make an observation, first of all, that if the liquid crystal is uh, isotropic, then it's easy to see that the uh, probability density in this case must be 1 over 4 pi. And so computing the second moment in this case, you get one third of the identity. And then uh, it's a common practice to uh, translate the second moment by subtracting the uh, isotropic version of it so that in the isotropic state, uh, the, your new vector, new tensor Q, uh, a so-called Q tensor, is going to vanish. Uh, this is sort of helpful when you later on want to uh, expand your energy around about the isotropic state. Uh, but again, for whatever theory you uh, is going to design, this, strictly speaking, is not necessary. And sometimes, actually, 
it is possible to work just with the second moment without subtracting anything from it. Okay, so then at the end of the day, this uh, Q-tensor matrix is going to be symmetric and traceless. Uh, so that means that its eigenvalues must add up to zero. Again, quoting Peter from before, uh, you can have then several situations, several possibilities here. Possibility number one is that two eigenvalues of this uh, matrix are going to be equal, so that will determine the third eigenvalue, uh, in which case Q will have a form like this, S is like that, that's the same degree of orientation from before. Uh, and then we'll say that uh, pneumatic liquid crystal in this case is going to be uniaxial. Uh, and N, uh, once again, is the same pneumatic director from before. It's a preferred orientation of uh, pneumatic molecules. Uh, if uh, you have no repeat attacking values, then the Q tensor can, can be written in this form, so you now have two distinct orientations, and so uh, in this case, uh, you call the pneumatic biaxial. And then when all three lambdas are the same, then clearly uh, they should, have, should all be zero. Uh, so by construction, uh, in this case, just because uh, Q was constructed as a second moment of uh, N tensor N, all these eigenvalues must lie within the bounds from minus one third to two thirds, then with appropriate least scaling, uh, you'll get to this magical uh, minus one half and one values that you have seen before uh, when I talked about um, Erickson's model. Okay, uh, elastic energy density. Um, so in this case, uh, it should be based uh, not on gradients of the director, but on the gradients of the Q tensor. Uh, so then somehow, uh, this energy will then um, incorporate in itself both uh, elastic um, deformation of N, but also an information about uh, deformation of uh, order parameter if Q is in a uniaxial state. Uh, so in this case, you have uh, these four components. Again, they're all, uh, they all have an appropriate uh, frame indifference and satisfy appropriate frame indifference and material symmetry um, assumptions. And in principle, those are not all possible uh, combination of uh, combination, all well, possible choices of uh, of the. Um, uh, elastic energy, as we will see later on, so other things are possible. In fact, in principle, more terms uh, one can add to this. Uh, not only one can add to this, but uh, in principle, one should add to this energy. Okay. Uh, so we have elastic energy, then we also have a landau dirichlet energy, uh, which is, uh, again, Peter discussed it, for our purposes, you can think of it as a kind of a penalty uh, potential term uh, that depends on Q and which forces Q to be uh, in a uniaxial pneumatic state per what I, what I discussed on the previous slide. Uh, so in particular, uh, in this case, um, the parameters uh, C is greater than zero, B I believe is better, uh, less than zero, and A is temperature dependent. Uh, if temperature is low, uh, then the value of A is such that uh, L L L landau dirichlet potential is minimized by, uh, is minimized by pneumatic, uniaxial pneumatic configurations. And if the temperature is high, then again, uh, it is minimized by isotropic configurations. So Q uh, being equal to zero. Uh, it looks like this because again, due to the rotational invariance of the frame indifference, uh, the uh, landau dirichlet potential only depends on the invariance uh, of a Q tensor. And once again, in, uh, again, in a similar fashion to what I uh, said before about a sin Frank energy functional uh, one has two choices. Either you can uh, prescribe Dirichlet boundary data on Q on the boundary of your domain, or you can, again, uh, 
add uh, some sort of a surface energy which uh, will penalize for an interaction between Q and the normal uh, to the boundary of your domain, and that again is uh, uh, going to give you either uh, so-called strong or weak anchoring. All right, so at the end of the day, uh, the landau dirichlet functional is going to look like this. It has an elastic energy which depends on Q uh, and gradient of Q. Uh, just maybe one more comment here. Uh, so you see that the first three terms uh, are all quadratic in the gradient, and the third term is uh, quadratic in the gradient but cubic in Q. Okay, so we have this energy and then plus surface energy, just a green color in this case, is added to indicate that either you do or you don't have this uh, contribution. Okay, so then without this cubic energy term, so when the uh, function is quadratic, uh, then um, the parameter L4 is equal to zero. So we're going to distinguish between two possible situations, L4 being zero and L4 not being equal to zero. Then, uh, subject to the appropriate constraints on uh, L1, L2, and L3, uh, you can show that this functional is uh, coercive. And uh, uh, so mathematically, this is uh, going to give you a well-defined problem. But at the same time, when you try to reduce this to um, a seen frank energy functional, we can simply plug in uh, Q in a uniaxial form into this, uh, into this energy, let's say S is a constant, so then you should be able to recover uh, an asymptotic frank energy, and indeed you do, uh, but you find that uh, in the asymptotic frank energy that you recover, uh, two elastic constants, uh, I believe bend and uh, twist, I don't remember, but uh, two elastic constants are going to be constant. So that means that if you only use L1 through L3 within the context of landau dirichlet theory, then that means that you're not going to be able to recover the full asin frank energy from this. Uh, so rigorous reduction of landau dirichlet uh, to asin frank in this context, in this context uh, when uh, all elastic constants except for L1 are equal to zero. So it essentially your elastic energy is uh, Dirichlet integral for Q. Uh, was done by Marjumrar Zarnescu, Nguyen and Zarnescu, uh, and Canivari. And let me talk about these results for a moment. So in fact, in this case, when you make this assumption, then uh, your landau dirichlet energy is just this. Uh, and also, um, Canivari and uh, myself and Montero, we also looked at this case, but um, under somewhat different conditions when, uh, when the domain is two-dimensional. So the results that I'm going to discuss are for a full problem when you have a three-dimensional domain and a three-by-three -three, uh, Q-tensor uh, order parameter. Uh, so after uh, you non-dimensionalize this problem, they end up with an expression which looks very similar to a Ginsburg-Landau problem, uh, to a Ginsburg-Landau energy functional, uh, except that now uh, you're working with Q tensors and uh, with landau uh potential function. Now if we subtract an appropriate constant from the landau dirichlet energy, then you can assume that it is always going to be positive for any symmetric traceless tensor, and it is going to vanish only if um, Q belongs to uh, the uniaxial pneumatic uh, manifold that is described like this. So if we uh, now look at uh, minimizing this functional in the space H1, subject to some boundary data, uh, which lies in N, then the following results are going to be true. So if uh, the parameter epsilon, which is uh, sometimes I think this is referred to as a limit of uh, vanishing uh, 
uh, elastic um, constants or also, I think this is called the pneumatic correlation length. Uh, so in a limit, epsilon goes to zero. Uh, and when domain is simply connected, we have the following thing. So if uh, the, uh, if Q epsilons are minimizers of uh, epsilon level functional F epsilon, and uh, if energies of Q epsilon are uniformly bounded, uh, by the way, I am uh, not stating theorems precisely as they appear uh, in this work, so I'm just uh, giving you a basic idea of why things work. Uh, so in, if the energy is bounded, is uniformly bounded, then uh, it turns out that uh, Q epsilon converged to the limit of the, uh, to the minimizer of the harmonic MEC problem, uh, orientable, and uh, it converges to, uh, uh, so in this case, the only uh, possible defects that uh, you will be able to see will be point defects of this form. So this is also uh, something called the radial, radial hedgehog. Uh, no line singularities will be possible. Uh, this also follows from um, uh, these previous works by Schoenel and Beck and Brises Coron and Lee. An extension of this by Canivari is to consider the energies which are actually blowing up in epsilon, blowing up in epsilon. So in this case, G is not necessarily a fixed uh, boundary data, but it's uh, you have some boundary data G epsilon in this case, and you are assuming in H one half. Then in this case, F epsilon is no longer bounded, but it is uh, going to blow up uh, not faster than logarithm of epsilon. Uh, then in this case. Uh, Along subsequences, again, you will converge to maps that are locally uh, minimizing and harmonic, uh, away from some set L, which uh, will has a, which will have a house of dimension one, and uh, it locally consists of a finite number of line singularities. So line singularities are possible, and we have this characterization. And in addition to line singularity, also locally you have uh, finitely many points, point defects. All right. Okay, so this is what happens if you, uh, if you consider a situation when L4, 15, yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we could consider the situation when there is no cubic term, so L4 is uh, not equal to zero. Uh, so when L4 is, uh, when L4 is equal to zero, when L4 is no longer equal to zero, then it is known that in that case, actually the landau dijans energy is no longer bounded from below. And so some additional steps have to be taken to make the problem uh, meaningful. Uh, so the one uh, possible uh, approach is, again, to make modifications. So uh, the basic uh, problem is that you have a landau dijans functional, which is a power of um, lambda. You have landau dijans potential, which is a power of Q, and you have a cubic energy term, which is Q times the gradient of Q squared. And so... The problem is that uh, if L4 is less than zero, then the elastic energy can overcome the potential energy, and that's a source of unboundedness from below. Uh, so one way to fix this is to get away from the uh, potential energy, which is the power of Q, and replace it by another potential energy, which is going to blow up if Q uh, is going to be beyond some physically reasonable uh, region. Uh, and again, so uh, remember that uh, we had uh, certain conditions because, because of the way the Q tensor was derived, its uh, uh, eigenvalues, 
have to lie within a certain bound. And in principle, if we just solve um, a, a problem for the uh, minimization problem for uh, landau dijens functional, we don't even know that uh, necessarily the eigenvalues are going to lie within the physical values, uh, within these physical bounds. So that any problem um, that uh, any, if you, if, you, if you want your um, uh, minimizer to be physical, you always have to check if uh, the eigenvalues do lie within these bounds or not. So, uh, one fix uh, proposed by uh, Ball and Majumdar was to replace landau dijens potential by the potential which is constructed on the basis of mean field theory, as uh, touched upon by Peter already. Uh, so, long story short, uh, what you do is you replace uh, landau dijens potential by this value, where f of q is a minimum of uh, these uh, uh, functional, subject to the con constraint that um, uh, Q of rho here must be equal to prescribed Q. Uh, when you introduce a functional like this, then we can show that uh, essentially when uh, you, your eigenvalues approach, the approach of values at the boundary of this minus one third to two thirds region, then the functional is going to blow up. Now you can use this observation uh, to establish the fact that the minimum of landau dijens energy is actually bounded. The minimum of landau dijens energy is attained even in the case when L4 is equal to zero. Uh, some additional um, results uh, for this model were obtained by Bauman and Phillips, some additional regularity results and also physicality results, the regimes when the, uh, uh, when the minimizers are physical were discussed by Bauman and Phillips. Uh, an alternative uh, study that one can do is not to actually worry about changing anything, but simply work with the original version of the functional L4 not being equal to zero, uh, but now discuss when is it possible, for example, to uh, evolve uh, uh, evolve uh, your Q tensors, Q tensor via gradient flow uh, using uh, the landau dijens energy functional and uh, obtain even some sort of an existence the result. And that was done for by uh, Yershu and Zarnescu, who showed that uh, actually, if you consider an L2 gradient flow for landau dijens energy, with L4 not being equal to zero, you have two possible things. So one thing is that you do have uh, existence, global existence of weak solutions subject to small initial data. And on the other hand, if you have uh, initial data which is large, uh, then you get a finite time blow up. Uh, so sometimes the model works and sometimes it doesn't. You would not expect that your uh, physical problem will give you the blow up. So that's problematic. Uh, and they also show that in some cases, uh, minimizers will, do, will preserve uh, physicality. Uh, the second alternative to this is to actually go back and think where uh, this landau dijens uh, original version of landau dijens energy came from. And uh, it came from, uh, so remember that we have four terms, L1 through L4, two uh, three quadratic terms and one third order term. Uh, while in reality, if you construct uh, somehow uh, many possible terms which satisfy the appropriate invariance going up to, uh, I believe, fourth order, uh, then it was shown by longer and collaborators then uh, there is a relatively large number of invariants uh, that one can uh, get for the uh, combinations of Q and gradient of Q, uh, 
uh, well beyond the four uh, terms that uh, have been used up to date. And uh, it seems that the principal reason for considering four terms has been that uh, people who introduced them initially basically wanted to recover all three elastic constants in a, uh, a sin franc limit. But it turns out that in this case, you end up with a functional with energy, which is not well behaved. So a possible alternative, uh, which we have done in collaboration with uh, Peter Stenberg and Mike Novak, uh, was to actually uh, propose not a third order, but fourth order energy, which will be well behaved. So again, based on the same term. And uh, to make a long story short, so basically you want to uh, design the elastic energy in such a way, and by no means this is the only possible combination of the terms. You want to design it in such a way so that it is number one, well behaved, number two, it reduces to, uh, it reduces to the sin franc, and it is sort of as simple as possible. And so if you uh, write energy like this, now L1, L2, L3, and L4 no longer uh, have any connection with L1, L2, L3, I mean, the, the, yeah, uh, that you have seen before, so it's an alternative version of landau dijans energy. Then uh, if your uh, N field is smooth, and let's say orientable, Q is uniaxial, you plug it in into this energy density and you recover exactly uh, the sin franc energy density that you want to get. And in fact, if you look at this, then clearly this energy is uh, always going to be bounded from below. It's positive and nice. So this, um, uh, the variational problem that is associated with this energy can be analyzed, so it's Again, the similar problem as what, for example, Majumdar Zarnescu and Kanivari considered, except that this is now for a different, uh, uh, for an energy with a different elastic term. And you basically end up with the same sort of conclusions that in uh, this case, the, what, what's a parameter epsilon before, now I call gamma, just to make things a little bit more confusing. Uh, if this parameter gamma goes to zero, then landau dijans potential forces uh, Q to be in a uniaxial pneumatic state. And so we have um, then the appropriate uh, theorems that would uh, work in this case. There is an existence. Uh, there is a limiting functional, which is basically the same as what I just mentioned. So if Q is in a uniaxial pneumatic state, then you compute sigma of Q on uh, uniaxial tensors, and that is going to be your, eventually a gamma limit as a parameter gamma goes to zero. And so we have a gamma convergence result, which uh, basically tells us that the asymptotic limit of um, this modified landau uh energy he is actually going to be in a sin franc energy with uh, one caveat. So, uh, I'm going to skip these details because I don't have too much time. When uh, a vector field, so, so you see that at the end of the day, you end up with an energy which is defined on order tensors that are uh, uniaxial pneumatic valued. So it is an asyn franc energy, essentially. It's kind of like an asyn franc energy, but it's not defined on orientable vector fields. It is defined rather on uh, these uniaxial pneumatic tensors. But if your vector field is orientable, then, then immediately this becomes an asyn franc energy. So it seems that uh, this alternative actually allows you to avoid the problems of, uh, that you encounter with the standard landau dijans energy. Okay, let me just cover a few more things. Uh, all right. 
So uh, one other question that arises when you consider Landau Gens versus Asin Frank, as I said before, Asin Frank is a uniaxial field. There is no uniaxial, there is no biaxiality within that field. Uh, once you relax Asin Frank, so basically our gamma convergence results basically tell us that uh, landau Gens is a relaxed version of Asin Frank in some sense. So when you do this relaxation, uh, the question is, would uh, the minimizers or critical points of landau Gens energy also be uh, uniaxial or would they be biaxial? So what happens when epsilon, when epsilon is zero, in a sense, then uh, we're dealing, of course, with uniaxial configurations. But when epsilon is greater than zero, apparently, uh, by uh, a result that was proved by Lamy, uh, if the landau Gens energy proved by Lamy, I believe, in the case when uh, uh, you have a single elastic constant, L1, uh, that in one-dimensional and two-dimensional configurations, all critical points of landau Gens energy are necessarily biaxial. Uh, so they may be not biaxial somehow to a large extent, but they're biaxial, and in fact, biaxial everywhere. And um, the only possible choice in this case uh, to have a uniaxial vector field if the vector field itself is constant. In 3D, it's not uh, like this. Uh, there is one configuration which uh, is uh, possibly uniaxial, and that's possibly a uh, radial, uh, so-called radial melting hedgehog. Uh, but that's it. Again, uh, I believe that in this case, uh, biaxiality should be taken sort of with a grain of salt because there is some small amount of biaxiality away from defects. So for all practical purposes, when epsilon is small, your fields are essentially uniaxial. And if there is any biaxiality, it should be restricted to cores of defects. Uh, a related, uh, actually, observation about uh, melting uh, radial hedgehogs, now melting because you have a uniaxial radial hedgehog, the only way for it to, um, uh, to deal with the singularity is to melt at the center, so that all the parameter at the center is going to be zero. But if you no longer require uh, orientability, uh, if um, you work with the Q tensor, so maybe your, uh, if you no longer require uniaxiality, at the core of a defect, you can become biaxial. And indeed, in a series of work by Frate, Ignat, Nguyen, Robbins, Slastikov, and Zarnescu, who are, I believe, all present, uh, it was shown, uh, and this actually also is related to uh, previous uh, results by Gartland and Davis that, uh, of course, there is much more in this works than, than this, but that's the only item that I wanted to mention, is that the radial hedgehog must be stable at uh, sufficiently high temperatures, and for sufficiently low temperatures, it is unstable. So that means that, again, uh, this confirms the same fact, that for low temperatures, the, uh, there is always a biaxiality somewhere in the cores of defects. Okay, and then very quickly, um, one more thing here. Uh, so we discussed already, uh, uh, just one minute. Uh, we already discussed the landau uh, for um, um, for standard domain. So now uh, the question is what sort of um, observations, mathematical observations you can make about uh, the configurations with colloidal particles. And uh, basically then the only thing that I want to say is that uh, in this meeting uh, later on, uh, you will see talks by uh, Lamy and Alama uh, who will discuss uh, these type of configurations. <laughs>
so one thing that I wanted to mention here is that if you have a, a pneumatic medium in the exterior of a ball, uh, then depending on the size of the ball, uh, you have two possibilities. If the ball is very really small, then the defect that you're supposed to see is just a single point defect. This is a known observation that comes from a previous numerical work, but it was uh, confirmed by Alama Bransard and Lamy. So uh, if, defect, if the particle is small, uh, there is a ring defect around the particle. If the particle is large, there is a point defect around the particle. And uh, you can consider, again, other situations, the same thing with the vector field uh, or uh, some other things that you will see later on. So that's, that's about it. And I don't have any time to mention the things that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Comments, questions, remarks? Please. Um, you considered higher order terms in the Landau de Gens theory. Actually, when we go beyond uh, quadratic deformations, so if we include Q, DQ, DQ, and QQ, DQ, DQ terms, as you did, Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a unique choice. What was your hidden rule to choose terms that you... So the rule was uh, basically this, uh, because at the end of the day you want divergence and curl. We simply computed divergence of Q and the curl of Q. And from that we figured out how to construct this. So it, it was basically a backward reconstruction. But like you said, it's not unique at all because many different terms in a limit will converge to the same thing. So and you can... Act, well, actually, if we look only at elastic properties of pneumatics, mm -hmm. we could choose many options right. that relieve the generacy of the second order, as, yes. as mm -hmm. we know. So. Apala, one further question. You, you mentioned that one way of enforcing that S is between minus a half and one is just to make the energy infinite somehow. But one could simply write S as P2 of cosine of theta and then do everything in, in that formalism and then you don't have to make any artificial Demand. But that, that's precisely what uh, I think uh, Apala and Jambol did. That, that's oh, a, that's a kind okay. of a... Huh? I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought um, the L4 term, the original one, Q grad, Q grad, Q, the reason people keep it is because it's a linear combination of the three... Um, in the, so there are three linear names. So this is from Lech Longer's paper. So I think there are six linearly independent cubic terms. And the reason they keep this particular choice of Q, grad Q, grad Q, is because it's a linear combination of all the linearly independent ones. So I had one question about your choice. I mean, is it just something that works? Or is it something that is actually incorporating all the six linear Yeah, linear it, is, it is something that works, yes. Uh -huh. something like at the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, uh, my understanding is that, in principle, you cannot out of all of this, and you can correct me, out of all of these zoo of terms, right, it's not clear which one you can or you cannot take because you cannot really measure elastic constant K1000 or something like that, right? So at the end of the day, as far as I understand, you can only measure K1, K2, K3, right? Is that... And so then um, you're left with just selecting what you want, because there is no other criteria, as far as I understand. I don't know if that answers your question. But at the end of the day, it's just it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so one final <laughs> comment. I have a comment concerning uniaxiality versus biaxiality. Mm -hmm. 
clearly for pneumatics, probably this is not really an issue. But if you take more complex pneumatics, like blue phases, you will find that biaxiality could be tremendous in those cases. Sure. So yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely.